Hello there. This lecture is all about chi square. Chi square, not chi square or chi square. Chi square, and it's something very different from what you are used to doing in statistics. Chi square is based on frequencies, not based on raw data. So again, this is slightly different from the type of data that you've been looking at with you know t tests and ANOVA and correlation. Okay, so just a summary of the topics in this lecture. I'm going to talk a little bit about parametric versus non-parametric tests. Parametric tests are the tests that we used previously, like you know the t-tests, ANOVAs, correlation, all that. Non-parametric tests are what we're going to be discussing in this lecture, which is the chi-square test is a non-parametric test. Then just a few of the assumptions of non-parametric tests, there aren't very many of them. Then I'll do an example showing you how to convert data that was originally meant for a parametric test like a t-test or an ANOVA, taking that data and turning it into data that could be used for a non-parametric test. So basically just using raw scores to turn data into frequency-based data. And I'll explain why in some situations that is something you would want to do. Then I will go over the basics of the chi-square test for goodness of fit, which is just a chi-square test with a single variable. Then the chi-square test for independence, which is the chi-square test for two variables. Then a summary of hypothesis testing with chi-square. So although this analysis is very different than what we've done in the past, we are still going to be doing hypothesis testing with all four steps. We're going to be stating a known alternative hypothesis, finding a critical value, calculating the test statistic, and then comparing that test statistic to the critical value to make our decision and state our conclusion. And then the next video will cover example problems for the chi-square test goodness of fit and then the chi-square test for independence. So again, all of the statistical analyses that you've learned about this semester were parametric tests. And parametric tests require a numerical score from each study participant. So when you look at the data for a parametric test, you're seeing all the scores, all of the measures for the dependent variable from that study. You also have to have scores that are on an interval or ratio scale, something that's numeric in nature. And parametric tests are all about using sample statistics, like the sample mean, to make inferences about population parameters, like the population mean. Remember, statistic is just the word for something, a numeric value that's used to explain characteristics of a sample. And then parameters is the term for a numeric value used to explain characteristics about the population. Now there's a problem with parametric tests and that usually occurs when you have a high degree of variability in your data. So remember, if you have more variability, then you have more error variance. So for instance, with the t-tests, if you have more spread of scores in your sample, then your standard error is going to be larger. And if your standard error is larger, then it's going to be harder to get a large t statistic. Remember, the standard error is in the denominator for t. You're comparing the actual difference to the standard error. So if you have a large degree of variability and a large standard error, you're dividing by a larger number when you calculate your observed t value. And your t value is going to be smaller and probably not going to fall in the critical region and allow you to reject the null hypothesis, which is what we always like to do. Also, if you think about ANOVA, if you have a lot of within groups variability, a lot of spread of scores within each group, then the denominator of your F statistic is going to be large, and the overall value for F will be smaller, and it won't be as easy to reject an all hypothesis and say that you do have a significant difference among your groups. So non-parametric tests, like the chi-square statistic, don't require a numerical score from each study participant because it's based on looking at categories and the frequency of participants that fit into each category. And this is great because the scores can be on any scale of measurement. You can put nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio variables into categories and count how many people meet each of those criteria. And the non-parametric tests aren't about looking at means, they're all about looking at frequencies. So for the non-parametric test, instead of using a sample mean to estimate the characteristics about a population mean, you're using sample frequencies and proportions to make inferences about population frequencies and proportions. Also, if you have a lot of variability in your data, 
the non-parametric test is not sensitive to that problem because when you convert raw scores into placing people into categories, it eliminates the variance. So when you have a lot of variability, it's not going to create big problems where it's really difficult to find significance. Even if, for instance, an independent variable is having an impact on a dependent variable, you may not be able to find significant results because you just have so much spread in your data that it's really hard to get a significant finding. That's not a problem with chi-square. So the assumptions of the non-parametric tests. So the first one is the independence of frequencies, which is just saying that each observed frequency is generated by a different individual. So there's no one participant that's in multiple groups. You also need to have pretty large samples to do a non-parametric test because, as you'll see in a little bit, there's this thing called an expected frequency. Well, if that expected frequency under the null hypothesis for any category is less than 5, even a really small discrepancy between the observed and expected frequency under the null can result in significant differences. So now I just want to show you an example of a situation where you started off with data that was, you know, on an interval or ratio scale and was ready to go for some sort of parametric test, but then you convert it into data that would be useful for a non-parametric test. So sometimes data that was collected with intentions of analyzing it with parametric tests don't meet the assumptions for the test. The frequency distribution for the data can then be used to place participants into categories, and then you can use non-parametric tests on them to analyze the data more accurately. So let's look at this single variable example. And this would be something like you would see for a single sample t-test, where we have all of the range of scores in our single sample and the frequency, how many times each one of those scores appears in our data. And we don't really want to do a t-test for single sample because we have a situation where we have a lot of variability in our scores. So if you calculate the standard deviation for this sample, it's 4.03. And if you compare that to the mean for this sample that happens to be 3.65, that standard deviation is a pretty big standard deviation. So our standard error would be really large, and even if we had a pretty substantial difference between our sample mean and population mean, probably wouldn't be that much larger than the standard error. So we would want to get rid of the variability by converting this raw data into frequency-based data for a non-parametric test. So you could categorize this. You could say, okay, I'm going to say that anybody with a score less than 5 is on the low end, and anybody with a score greater than or equal to 5 is considered on the high end. So you would just count how many people in my study have a score of less than 5. Well, if we look at x, Okay, well, less than 5, that would be all these scores here. And we say, okay, 5 plus 6 is 11, plus 5 is 16, plus 3 is 19. So 19 people have a score less than 5. Bam. High scores. How many people have a score greater than or equal to 5? 10 is the only score that's greater than or equal to 5 in this sample, and there's 7 people with that score. And now you have data that's ready for a chi-score test of goodness of fit. Here's another example. So let's say that you have a situation where you were getting ready to do a correlation analysis. And you have four people in your data set. And the first person had a 5 on whatever x was and a 6 on whatever y was, for example. And then you just go all the way down to the last person who is an outlier. They had a score of 15 on X and a score of 15 on Y. And that's way, way large compared to all the other scores. So if you calculated the correlation coefficient for this data, you would find that it's very strong and positive with a correlation of 0.898. But if you look at the raw data, you can see that X and Y are not consistently positively related. So look at this. We would expect that as X increases, Y increases if there's a true positive relationship, and that's not the case. Like, X goes from 5 to 7 here, and Y actually decreases from 6 to 3. And then you see, oh, 5 is smaller than 8, but 6 is larger than 5. You don't see that positive relationship happening. The whole reason that the correlation said that there was a strong positive relationship is because of this crazy outlier. So remember, with the 
non-parametric test, we don't have to worry about problems with variability or outliers. So we can just go ahead and convert this into something that we could use for a chi-square test. So again, we're going to categorize these scores. We would say anybody with an x less than 8 is considered on the low end of x. Anybody with an x greater than or equal to 8 is considered on the high end of x. Anybody with a y less than 8 is considered the low end of y. And anybody with a y greater than or equal to 8 is considered on the high end of whatever y is. So we would say, OK, among all the people with a low x less than 8, that would be these two. So how many have a low y? Well, both of these people with x less than 8 have a y less than 8. So bam, 2 goes right there. Then of the people with a high x value greater than or equal to 8, how many have a low y value? So here's our high x values, you know, 8 or higher. One has a y less than 8, and one has a y greater than or equal to 8. So 1 and 1. And then among the people with a low x less than or equal to 8, nobody has a high y value, right? So these two, nobody has a high y. And you see 1, 2, 3, 4 people in this study. 1, 2, 3, 4 is what the frequencies add up to in this table. Now, I'm never going to ask you to do something like this. I just wanted to show you an example of how you can convert data for a parametric test into data for a non-parametric test and help you better understand what the numbers in these tables represent. So now I want to introduce you to the chi-score test for goodness of fit. This is the chi-square test that we use when we have a single variable that we're examining. And the way that the data will be presented would be in a single row with multiple columns. So each different column represents a different level of whatever variable you are measuring. And remember, we assume independent observations. So there's no one person that fits into multiple groups here. So this is kind of like this example right here. That would be for a chi-square test of independence. So this type of chi-square test compares the observed frequencies in the sample to the expected frequencies based on the proportions in the null hypothesis. And before I get into the two different types of null hypothesis, I just want to make sure that you understand these symbols here. So this FO is the statistical notation for frequencies observed in the sample. Think about it. Frequencies observed. This phi, this FE, that just represents the frequencies expected under the null hypothesis. Frequencies expected. Now there's two different types of null hypothesis for the chi-score test goodness of fit. The first kind, and the most simplistic kind, is assuming that under the null hypothesis there's equal proportions. So you would expect that the frequency in each group would be the same under this type of null hypothesis for the chi-score test goodness of fit. There's another kind of null hypothesis that assumes that we're testing our sample against specific proportions from a certain group, from a population. So we would no longer be expecting equal frequencies under the null hypothesis in our sample, but we would expect that the frequencies match the proportions in the population. So if we thought that in the population, there's 50% of people with this level, 20% of people with this level, and 30% of the people with this level, we would expect that in our sample, 50% of the frequencies would be here, 20% would be here, and 30% would be here. It would no longer be equal. Let me give you another example. So sometimes it makes sense to test a hypothesis based on equal proportions or equal frequencies. So for example, you could see if there's a significant difference in the number of students earning A's, B's, C's, D's, or F's in Psychology 210. So under the null hypothesis, we would take that sample, the class, and divide it by what? One, two, three, four, five. So there's five different types of grade. You would divide it by five. Let's say we had 50 students in the class divided by five. You would expect under the null that 10 people would be in each group. Well, sometimes testing a hypothesis about equal frequencies does not make sense, and you would want to test a hypothesis about specific proportions. So think about this example when we um, do equal proportions and why it wouldn't make sense. So let's say that we wanted to see if significantly more A's, 
in Psychology 210 come from pre-nursing majors compared to non-pre-nursing majors. So under the null hypothesis, you would expect that 50% of A's come from pre-nursing majors and the other 50% of A's come from non-pre-nursing majors. Think about why this may be a problem. So again, we want to see if significantly more A's come from pre-nursing majors versus non-pre-nursing majors. Well, the problem would be that there are far more pre-nursing students in the class than other majors. So, if we were looking at the data, it may appear that more A's come from pre-nursing students than other majors just because there are more pre-nursing students to begin with. So you would want to test the hypothesis based on specific proportions. So let's say that the proportion of nurses in the class, let's say there's 80% of pre-nursing majors. Well, under the null hypothesis, you would expect that 80% of the A's would come from pre-nursing majors, and the remaining 20% of the A's would come from non-pre-nursing majors. In this case, you would use those specific proportions, and a 50-50 split among non-pre-nursing majors and pre-nursing majors wouldn't make sense because each group is not equal in size. So I hope that helps you understand why sometimes testing hypothesis about equal proportions just does not make sense and can be very misleading. Now let's look at the chi-score test for independence. So this is when you have multiple variables, and so you have multiple rows with multiple columns. And each column represents a different level of variable y, and each row represents a different level of variable x. And much like the correlation analysis, we typically assign the variable that we think is the independent variable labeled as x, so the independent variable will be the basis of the rows, and the dependent variable, variable y, what we think is the dependent variable, we still can infer causation with chi-square, but anyway, we would put that variable along the columns. So the chi-square test for independence is the same, has the same assumption as the chi-square test for goodness of fit, that independence of observation. So each category represents a certain level of both variables. And again, only, or each participant can only fall into one category. So in this case, if we had three levels of Y and two levels of X, we'd have a situation where no one person falls into multiple groups. And this kind of looks like um, the setup for a two-factor analysis of variance. But instead of looking at means, we're looking at frequencies inside of there. So again, the chi-score test is a lot like correlation. It's just we're using frequency-based data. And we're comparing the observed sample frequencies for these two variables to the expected frequencies under the null. So just like chi-square, goodness of fit, we're comparing observed frequencies to expected frequencies under the null hypothesis. Observed frequencies in the sample to expected frequencies under the null. But for the chi-square test for independence, the null hypothesis assumes that the proportion of frequencies for each x group is equal across each y group. So for instance, if we wanted to look at the number of A's, B's, and C's based on pre-nursing or non-pre-nursing majors, we would have pre-nursing, not pre-nursing, A's, B's, and C's. And we would expect an equal proportion across both of these. So if 30% of the entire class got an A, then you would expect that 30% of the pre-nursing would have an A, and 30% of the non-pre-nursing would have an A under the null hypothesis. If 20% of the class got a B, then you would expect that 20% of pre-nursing would have a B, and 20% of non-pre-nursing would have a B. If 20% of the class got a C, you would expect that 20% of pre-nursing would have a C, and 20% of non-pre-nursing would have a C under the null hypothesis if there was no relationship between X and Y, major and grades, for example. So let's go over the four steps of a hypothesis test with chi-square. So step one is stating the hypothesis. And there's three different types of hypothesis for this, two for goodness of fit and one for chi-square test of independence. So if you're assuming equal proportions, the way that you would state the hypothesis for the null would be the distribution of whatever variable it is you're measuring. Don't say x, actually state what variable it is. So the distribution of something is not significantly different across groups. 
Then for the alternative, it's the same exact thing, it's just it is significantly different across groups. If your null hypothesis is based on specific proportions, then you would say the distribution of whatever it is you are looking at in the sample is the same as whatever the distribution is in some population, whatever group you're comparing it to. You won't say some population, you'll actually fill that in with what you're comparing your sample to. Then for the alternative, same thing, it's just now you're saying it's not the same. So there is a difference. Then for the chi-square test of independence, you would say under the null, there's no relationship between whatever the two variables are that you're measuring. Again, you're not going to put x and y, you're going to put in what your variables are. Or you could say x and y are independent from each other. Then under the alternative, there is a relationship between these two variables, or these two variables are dependent. Now for step two, finding the critical region. So you only need two pieces of information to find the critical value to then locate the critical region for the chi-square distribution. The first thing you need is the degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom for the chi-square test for goodness of fit is equal to C minus one. C stands for the number of columns. So if you had a situation that looked like this, your degrees of freedom would be two. One, two, three columns minus one is two. For the chi-square test of independence, the degrees of freedom is calculated by taking the number of columns minus one and multiplying that by the number of rows minus one. There's parentheses here, so you need to solve for what's in the parentheses first, and then you would multiply. So if we had data that looks like this, we would have three columns minus one would be two, two rows minus one would be one, and two times one is two, two would be your degrees of freedom. You also need to know your alpha level. And remember, the most common alpha level in research is alpha level of 0.05. And with an alpha level of 0.05, that tells you that in order to reject the null hypothesis and say that, yes, my chi-square statistic falls in my critical region, your chi-square must fall in the extreme 5% of the chi-square distribution. And you would be pretty confident, 95% confident, that is, that your extreme chi-square statistic is not due to type 1 error. There's only a 5% chance that that would happen due to some fluke in your data and not due to true differences. And the chi-square distribution looks a lot like the distribution for the F statistic for ANOVA. It's positively skewed. There's no such thing as negative values for chi-square because we're squaring values. You'll see that when we get to the calculations. And remember, any negative times a negative is a positive. So when you square something, it always becomes positive. And a positive times a positive is a positive. So no matter what, we're working with positive numbers. So now we don't have to worry about one or two tailed tests. Just like ANOVA, we're just testing for differences. We're not being specific about one or two tailed tests here. So again, positively skewed distribution, and we are only looking for values out here to reject the null hypothesis in the extreme right end of the distribution. And under the null, most values fall at a 1, meaning that the observed matches the expected. So what you see in your data matches what you would expect in the null hypothesis. So this is a picture of the chi-square distribution table that you'll be using to find critical values. And you can see that positively skewed distribution. It's a lot prettier than the one I created, but there it is. Your degrees of freedom, and then your your alpha level across here. That's what proportion and critical region stands for. Now let's take a look at the formulas for the chi-square statistic. So this would be step three of the hypothesis test where you actually calculate the observed chi-square. So for independence and goodness of fit chi-square tests, the overall formula looks the exact same. You take for each group, because we're going to sum it at the end, right? We take the frequency observed for one group minus the frequency expected for that group, find that, and then square it, and divide it by the frequency expected for that group. Do that for each group and add those values together once you get to the end. But the difference between the different types of chi-square test lies in how you calculate the expected frequencies. Because the observed frequencies are just the frequencies in your data. But remember, under the null hypothesis, that's where we get our expected frequencies. And for all of the different chi-square tests, we have different types of null hypothesis. So, for goodness of fit, 
when you are expecting equal proportions under the null hypothesis, there's really two ways that you can calculate the expected frequency for each group. The first way is to take the expected proportion and multiply that by the sample size. And the expected proportion can be found by just taking one, right, the proportion for the entire group, right, that's like a purport, the entire proportion, divided by, that would be like 100%, right, divided by the number of groups, the number of columns, that's what C represents. And then you multiply that by N. So PE, the proportion expected is the same as saying 1 divided by C for the equal proportions. A much easier way to find the expected frequencies for the chi-square test goodness of fit when your null hypothesis is expecting equal proportions is to just take your sample size, divide it by the number of groups that you have, and voila, there you go. So for instance, if you had 50 people in your sample and you had two groups, you would have 25 in each sample, 50 divided by 2, or 25 in each group. Equal frequencies, right, because of equal proportions. Now it gets a little more complicated when you have a chi-score test for goodness of fit, but you have specific proportions in the population. So you can't just simply take the number in your sample and divide it by the total number of groups. You have to say, okay, for each group, what is the expected proportion based on the population? And then multiply that by the sample size. And you do that for each group because each group is going to have a different expected proportion. So for each group, you take the expected proportion based on the population for that group, multiply it by the sample size. And I just kind of restated that here. Then for the chi-square chi test of independence, I don't know why that was a tongue twister, to find the expected frequencies, you take the frequency, and let me kind of just demonstrate it with a picture here. So you take, let's say we were finding the expected frequency for this group right here. You would take the frequency of this row, so you'd add all these together and get something here, multiplied by the frequency for this column, so you'd add these numbers up and multiply this. It would be whatever these add up to, multiply by whatever these add up to. And then you would divide that whoop, by the sample size. So FC stands for the frequency for the column associated with that group. And FR stands for the frequency for the row associated with that group. And then N still stands for the sample size. So if you calculate your chi-square statistic in step three and you get a really large value for a chi-square goodness of fit, this suggests that there's just a very large discrepancy between the proportions in the data and the proportions in the null hypothesis. Either there's a very unequal distribution across groups, if you have a chi-square test goodness of fit equal proportions under your null, or that the proportions in your sample do not match the proportions in your population if you're doing a chi-square goodness of fit with specific population proportions. If you calculate a large chi-square test for independence, then that suggests that there is a stronger relationship between the two variables that you're looking at and that they are independent or they are dependent on each other. They're not independent. Then finally, step four, you just make your decision and state your conclusion. So if you calculate a large chi-square statistic that exceeds the critical value, you can celebrate, reject the null, do your happy dance, and suggest that whatever the alternative hypothesis was, was accurate. So when you state your conclusion, if you reject the null, you can just restate the alternative hypothesis. If the observed chi-square is less than the critical value, then you're kind of failing to reject the null hypothesis, and you would restate the null hypothesis for your conclusion. You fail to reject it, so your conclusion is, yes, the null hypothesis is probably true. All right, so I encourage you to attempt what you can in the example problems before you watch the video. Maybe even, you know, attempt doing, you know, step one two, and two for all of them. And then maybe watch me do the first goodness of fit and then attempt the rest of the goodness of fit for the second example. And then watch me do the first chi-square test for independence and then attempt the second one, all steps of it, on your own before watching the solutions. The best way to make sure you understand something is to test yourself and then go back and see what you understood and what you maybe not understood so well.